So now I think in USA, it is now 9, 10 or so in the morning. Is that right, by James? So before we start, now we will listen opening speech by Dean of uh, FAM at IPB University, Professor Dr. Nunung Nuryatono. Please, Pak Nunung. Thank you, Pak Hari. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening for all participants from Indonesia, India, and Southeast Asia. Good afternoon for the participants from European countries. We have colleague from Finlandia, but any we have a colleague from Germany. But Sunny, thank you for your uh, joining this very interesting seminar. And also a good night from a colleague, a colleague from Australia. I believe some colleague from Australia also joining this event. First of all, I would like to thanks to the Excellency Vice Rector, Professor Dodi, and then the Honorable Speakers, Dr. James Thomas Erbo from Dartmouth College. As we may know that Dartmouth College is the ninth oldest higher education in US. We are very lucky today, Dr. James will share the important issue related to the global issue in forest and environment, perspective on policy and human well-being. And I will, secondly, I would also give a high appreciation to the Department of Environmental and Resource Economics or ASN Ekonomi Sumber Daya Lingkungan, where headed by Dr. Ahyar and all staff who very actively have the regular Green Talk series. This is the third Green Talk series and all discussion very interesting actually when we see from the first until the third of the green talk uh, discussion series we see this is not directly related to the uh, covid 19 but of course as the title global issue and the participant as well is also from a global all over the world. Yeah, uh, the global issue in forest and environment. Again, as we may know that the role of forest is very important. I note that in, if I'm not mistaken, in Pakistan, there are some interesting idea during the COVID-19 pandemic, how government push the people to have a new plan in surrounding forest area. I do believe that it is also can be implemented in Indonesia to restore and then to replant again some marginal area in Indonesia. The role of forest and environmental is very important uh, nowadays. We cannot neglect how forest can fit the people, how forests can give a important biodiversity for the world. And again, I repeat that uh, on the first Green Talk series, I'm mentioning that I was mentioning about the interesting serial, uh, what we call it serial from National Geography. This is one uh, BBC Earth, this is another series BBC Earth, uh, called uh, Earth from Space. We can see the different part of uh, Earth from space, how forests get already converted into different uh, activities. I don't want to give a talk uh, note. And again, thank you very much for all participants, Pak Hari, who also actively connecting us with all scientists in the world. And we are also thanks to 
all participants, but James particularly, who connect us and deliver very interesting speed. Professor Dodi will directly moderate uh, be moderator for this uh, seminar. And one more thing, uh, on behalf of IPB, I would like to officially open this Green Talk series, uh, the third Green Talk series. Thank you, Sharima. Uh, with saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, officially I open uh, this uh, Green Talk series. Times uh, you, uh, uh, Harry. Thank you so much, uh, pa Professor Nunung, for your opening speech and also opening the session, as well as your guidance. That is very much appreciated. Now, uh, the Green Talk today will be moderated by Professor Dodi Nurrahmat. Now, please allow me to read a resume of the moderator. Let me check with the PowerPoint. So, Professor Dodi Ridono Rahmat is currently Vice Rector of IPB University for Collaboration and Information System. Previously served as Director of Strategic Studies and Agriculture Policy in IPB University. He was promoted as a full professor on forest policy at the Faculty of Forestry IPB since 2017 and obtain the certificate of prime professional engineer or IQ from the Indonesian Engineer Association in the same year. He had been invited as the guest lecturer, researcher in university abroad, such as University of Malaysia Sabah, Leeds University UK, Gottingen in Germany, and being counterpart or joint supervisor of some research project of the student both thesis and dissertation, for instance, in Oxford University, UK, Lausanne University, Switzerland, Copenhagen and Roskilde University, Michigan University of United States, and many more. Pak Dodi is also known to have strong network with various institutions, including Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Finance, Bapenas, Bank Indonesia, Parliament, Presidential Adversary Council, and in several institutions such as World Bank, ADB, ITTO, C4, and many more institutions. Padodi has been member of Editorial Advisory Board of the Journal of Forest Policy and Economics, Elsevier, from 2013 until now, as well as Chairman of Editorial Board for the Journal at national level and also uh, international level. Pak Dodi holds a bachelor from Department of Forest Management, Faculty of Forestry IPB in 1994, master degree on forest economic at the University of Gottingen, Germany. During his study in Germany, he served also as the chairman of the Indonesian Student Association, Association of PPI at the Gottingen. In 2005, he earned his PhD degree on forest policy and nature conservation at the same university with predicate summa cum laude. During his career, he has been an author, editor, and co-author of hundreds of popular and scientific articles, including 20 books. During his services for IPB, he received award of Satya Lenchana Karya, Satya 10 years service in 2012 and 20 years served in 2018 from the President of Republic Indonesia and many more awards. So, Pak Dodi, please moderate this event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barry. Assalamualaikum. Good evening, everybody. Uh, may I shortly introduce our speaker today? Our speaker today is uh, Dr. James Thomas Erbuk. Usually, we just call him a GT. GT studied master at Oxford University, UK, and completed PhD degree at Michigan University at Ann Arbor, USA. Now he is a postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth College, Hanover, USA. 
uh, he's spent uh, several years uh, for research in Indonesia in Central Java and Jambi. So uh, he is very, very familiar with the uh, Indonesian situation. He speak uh, Bahasa Indonesia very well, and uh, I think uh, uh, he should be here at the time uh, for uh, uh, postdoctoral research. Actually, but uh, due to the COVID-19, uh, he has to uh, postpone uh, and make a reschedule all of the plan. Uh, James, you have uh, about 45 minutes maximum for presentation, and then the rest, uh, 20 uh, minutes, we uh, have a time for discussion. Time says yours, James. Please. All right, thank James, you very much. Yeah, I will share my screen here. Can you see this? I hope so. Um, OK. So I first want to say thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to present to the community at IPB and the greater community that's watching today. Um, it's been my pleasure to be able to work with Pak Dodik and uh, the community at the Ag Institute of Bogor for guess it's been about 10 years now uh, we've been collaborating. And today I'm going to be presenting on perspectives on policy and well-being, specifically as they relate to uh, the forest and environment. Um, although a lot of this has been said, what I wanted to highlight is that um, over the course of my academic career, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in Bogor at IPB uh, to work with Pat Dodik and other faculty and community members. And it has been one of the pleasures of my professional career to be able to work with such intelligent and um, knowledgeable people, um, specifically in the Faculty of Forestry and the um, Agricultural Policy Department. What I'd like to do today is to discuss um, first how forests and well-being relate and why I tend to focus on well-being as opposed to livelihoods or um, payments. I then want to transition to considering the role of policy and governance for strengthening and promoting pathways between forests and well-being. My objectives for today are to consider forest and well-being pathways, to assess the role of policy and governance, and to discuss critical issues in contemporary forest governance. The conservation of intact forests and restoration of degraded forest landscapes are two of the most promising, cheap, and immediately realizable natural climate solutions. What that means is they are some of the most effective ways in which we can deal with climate change. And in addition, forests contribute to the livelihood and well-being of approximately 1.6 billion forest proximate people. And that's around the world the largest segment of these people live in the global south and specifically in the tropics. Thus, these landscapes that are incredibly valuable for mitigating climate change and promoting human adaptation to climate change also are the center of a lot of co-benefits. So these co-benefits include biodiversity conservation as well as provisioning ecosystem services for the people who live in and near these forests. However, as many of us in this group know, um, forest loss continues and has continued pretty consistently over the past 50 years. Um, this represents a collective action problem, which I'll just discuss a little bit later. In order to search for, find, and provide solutions to this collective action problem that is forest loss, we need environmental policy and governance to secure pathways between forests and the way in which they provide human well-being to those who live in and around forests. Now, it's come to my attention that you had had previous conversations in this seminar series about payments for ecosystem services. Payments for ecosystem services is a way in which we conceptualize how ecosystems contribute to uh, the benefit of humankind. 
There are supporting services, provisioning, regulating, and cultural services. Now, I tend to focus on human well-being uh, as the type of benefits that ecosystems, including forests, can provide to human communities. Human well-being is a multidimensional concept. Um, oftentimes in analysis, we tend to focus on one or two of these different dimensions, particularly income or assets. However, it's more important to consider the host of factors that lead to human flourishing or prosperity. Indeed, this is actually the remit of economics and specifically forest economics. How do forests contribute to human flourishing? There are several different multidimensional indicators now in use, some of them including the multidimensional poverty indicator, uh, which is a successor of the human development indicator that take this idea of multidimensional uh, well-being very seriously. And it's important to begin to consider how ecosystem services contribute to human well-being. One of the projects that I'm involved with uh, has generated a survey application to be used in the field. So when we're all doing field work again, if this is of interest to you, please reach out to me. It seeks to provide a survey application that survey enumerators, the people distributing the survey, can use to understand how forests contribute to the livelihood and well-being of forest proximate communities. If you're interested in that, you can find more information on forestlivelihoods.org, which is the FLARE website, which stands for Forest and Livelihoods Analysis, Research, and Evaluation. So, there are many different ways in which ecosystems contribute to human well-being. And if we look at this diagram from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, we see that it's not at all simple the way in which these different ecosystem services contribute to the well-being of people. I like to simplify the way we think about the contribution of forest ecosystems to people through these three different pathways, numbered one, two, and three. If we look at the pathway three, forest ecosystem function to human well-being, that's capturing a lot of the relationships here in the previous slide, where we see ecosystem services contributing rather directly to human well-being in different ways. However, a more capacious or expansive, comprehensive understanding of how forests contribute to human well-being also considers the fact that the organization of forest conservation or restoration projects also contributes to human well-being, either indirectly through the pathway one to three by providing improved forest ecosystem function, which then contributes to human well-being, or projects can contribute directly to human well-being through payments, like payments for ecosystem services, or providing jobs as through national park services around the world, and protected areas management. And this more expansive or comprehensive view of how forests contribute to well-being, not only through ecosystem function, but also through the social organization of conservation or restoration projects, has become a greater focus of late when it comes to understanding how forests and well-being are connected. I'm highlighting some of the results uh, from some of my colleagues, Dan Miller and Reem Hajar. This came out in World Development last year, and it was a literature review of how forests contribute to well-being or prosperity around the world and what different studies were saying. Now, if you look at the way in which academics have been studying forests and well-being over time, what we'll see is that economic living standards and material living standards have historically, um, as well as economic asset ac accumulation, have historically been some of the most studied elements and indeed remain so today when it comes to forests and people. So most of the studies that focus on forests and well-being tend to focus on uh, economic outcomes. However, what you'll notice is that more recently, Issues such as governance, security and safety, and economic equity, in addition to subjective well-being, are becoming more of a study focus. Indeed, this reflects this multidimensional aspect of human well-being and how forests can contribute to it. 
we look around the world, many of the studies are coming from Brazil, Mexico, China, India, and to some extent Indonesia and East Africa. This is a pretty decent spread, and a lot of these studies uh, reaffirm the fact that forests, when, um, when certain institutional processes align, can contribute indelibly to uh, human well-being. However, there are significant barriers to this relationship between forests providing a well-being benefit. Some of these barriers uh, include the value of land conversion. So recent work by Curtis et al. in science looked at the most proximate drivers of forest cover loss around the world. And as you can imagine, commodity-driven deforestation, that is forests cut down to plant agricultural crops that, are produ that produce commodities is one of the leading causes of um, the failure to conserve store forests. If we are able to specifically plan um, and protect forests, there still are several barriers to the conservation and restoration of forests. And those include unclear forest management rules, as well as implementation difficulties, which might mean budget shortfalls or staffing shortfalls uh, that allow for this value of land conversion to overtake formal rules for forest conservation and restoration. Now, even if there is allotted land for forests, there can still be a failure to convert project or forest services into improved well being. Those obstacles include conversion obstacles, so it's difficult to go from, let's say, the provisioning of a forest good to making human well-being impacts on the ground. It might be an issue with supply chains, um, as well as distribution of benefits. Who is actually accruing the benefits from forest resources? Is it the people who live most close to the forest, or is it people who live remotely? As well as payoff schedules. If we think about different generations of people and how they benefit from forest ecosystems, it might be the case that a current generation is not seeing the benefits of forest restoration, whereas the next generation comes along in 25 years, would be able to see benefits such as supporting and provisioning services from restored forests. So these are all different barriers that prohibit that direct line between forests and human well-being. And this is why policy and forest governance plays an important role in how we manage forests, uh, in addition to how people receive well being benefits. Now, before I jump into this, a few definitions that will be helpful for us as we continue. First, I refer to policy as a system of principles to guide action toward an objective. This is a pretty general definition that often is at the root of a lot of policy studies work. Governance, on the other hand, is a system of rules at all levels of human activity, from family to the international organization, in which the pursuit of goals through the exercise of control has transnational repercussions. I like this definition by Rosenau. And if we spoke, focus specifically on environmental governance, they are interventions aimed at changes in environment-related incentives, knowledge, institutions. So policies are the principles and the objectives that a given entity, maybe it's a nation, maybe it's a corporation, seeks to implement. Governance is the way in which those objectives are reached. At least that's how I interpret these terms and how I'll be using them today. There are several contemporary issues in forest governance that are of interest to a wide range of scholars and policy practitioners. I'm going to be covering just three of those to day, um, and those include decentralization reforms, non-state market-driven governance, and international commitments. So first, 
there has been a trend over the past 40 years now for national governments to decentralize forest management and use. When I use that term, decentralize, what I'm referring to is the provision, what we call the devolution of forest management rights to more local units. Now, more local units can refer to subnational administrative units. In the case of Indonesia, that would be going from the nation to the province or to the district. But it can also refer to the decentralization or the devolution of rights to local communities and indigenous people. This has happened around the world and is one of the most obvious and kind of telling changes that has occurred in forest governance and forest policy in recent history. Despite the fact that nations still lay claim to the majority of the world's forests, that is national governments still own the majority of the world's forests, we're seeing a great deal of those national forests being managed by more local entities. Social forestry in Indonesia is a recent example of how decentralization aims to connect forests with local well-being. So in the case of decentralization reforms, national governments are seeking to connect people, specifically proximate, forest proximate people, the ability to manage and use forests. The thinking being that those who are more directly related to forest management who depend on them more will have an incentive for the proper and sustainable management of forest systems into the future. Additionally, there's a concept called deliberative democracy that posits when we get together and discuss, deliberate the way in which we should govern one another, that that is the essence of a functioning, functional democratic system. So if you think about decentralization, especially at a hyper-local level, community forest management, let's say, this also kind of promotes this idea of deliberative democracy, that people get together, they have management rights, and that they decide on how best to manage forests and the way in which to proceed about implementing those objectives. In Indonesia, as I'm sure many of you are well aware, Social forestry is slotted to account for 10% or more of the national forest, national forest extent, the state forest in Indonesia, and has increased precipitously over the past five years. Um, and the idea behind this is to provide communities a more direct well-being benefit from the forests on which they already depend. We've seen this occur in other countries as well, Nepal, Uganda, with differing effects. The evidence on decentralization reforms remains mixed. And there are certain studies that have looked at what data is not collected on community forestry, on hyperlocal forest management. And it's unclear right now whether or not there are there are there is ex excessive evidence or very strong evidence from a causal inference perspective that forests contribute across the board to um, economic well-being. It is pretty clear, however, that it, these forests are contributing to subjective well-being, that they provide an aesthetic, cultural, spiritual benefit to those people who are most interested in managing forests. So if we think about well-being as a multidimensional concept, we can understand that it does, forests do contribute and decentralization reforms do strengthen the pathway from forests to human well-being. Now, another contemporary issue is the emergence of non-state market-driven governance. Non-state market-driven governance eschews this traditional state-centered authority and supporters of non-state market-driven governance approach turn to customers directly to create compliance mechanisms, either through positive incentives such as market access or price premiums, or negative incentives such as direct targeting or boycott campaigns. So the primary components of non-state market-driven governance are that uh, there is a type of 
direct governance that occurs between corporations and consumers that seeks to influence the way forests and human well-being are related. There are a lot of examples of non-state market-driven governance, and some of the most visible examples are eco-certifications. Um, this is SVLK in Indonesia and Indonesian Legal Wood for Stewardship Council certification, PEFC certification. Um, these are all types of timber certifications that aim to provide uh, greater market share to those corporations, companies that participate in them um, and, and abide by more stringent standards for forest production. I bring this up, this idea of non-state market-driven governance in a conversation in this presentation on forests and human well-being because this is a method from outside the state that seeks to channel uh, sustainable forest governance. Now, the most direct eco-certifications, the most directly related eco-certifications to forest management um, might seem like those that focus on timber and timber provision. But we also see a host of sustainable agricultural commodity certifications that are having a large influence on how land or forest land is converted to make way for agricultural commodities. One such example is the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO. Indeed, I'm sure a lot of you have been reading about RSPO. I only bring it up to mention it as another example of non-state market-driven governance, which is trying to ensure that people are benefiting from forest lands um, in a way that wouldn't otherwise be possible without this eco-certification. Because the clearing of a forest land is similarly a benefit that forests provide to people. Now, finally, more recent than the four examples that I've already touched on very briefly are zero deforestation pledges that have been made by a number of large corporations around the world. These zero deforestation pledges seek to remove deforestation or additional deforestation from the supply chain of some of the major uh, agricultural commodity producers. There has been a proliferation of research on zero deforestation commitments over the past four years that investigates who is making them, who is abiding by them, and what to what level we can hold companies accountable for actually removing deforestation from the supply chain. And the general consensus is that without transparency from the corporations themselves, it's very difficult to hold any one company accountable for pledging to remove deforestation. So there's a kind of a growing amount of discontent about these pledges. It seems like the, the desire is good, but it's difficult to hold companies accountable when we aren't able to see where and when they are expanding because some of that information is not being shared with the public. Um, Toby Gardner in 2018 released uh, some research in world development that looked at specifically the transparency uh, related to zero deforestation and other types of environmental pledges made by agricultural commodity producers. The final major policy trend that I will discuss today takes the form of international commitments. So we've discussed how nations are decentralizing forest management so that um, forest proximate people or more local governments are able to manage forests to provide human well-being benefits for those people who are closest to the resources. That was the first policy trend. The second policy trend I discussed, or governance trend, is that of non-state market-driven um, governance, which seeks to work directly with consumers to channel more sustainable forest management to ensure that the distribution of forest benefits are a bit more equitably distributed. Now, 
we're talking about international commitments last because these take the form of a more standard international relations approach where we're thinking about nation states, nations, and uh, the commitments they make as an ultimate driver for how forests are managed and for how people benefit from them. Some of the most sweeping commitments um, that have been made recently that are related to how forests provide well-being benefits to people include the nationally determined contributions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, specifically related to Paris agreements, as well as the bond challenge for forest restoration and several others, like the New York Declaration on Forests. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the bond challenge right now. The bond challenge aims to begin forest restoration on 350 million hectares by 2030. Um, the figure that I present on my screen right now looks at reforestation opportunities by different metrics. So it looks at panel A, looks at reforestation opportunities. Uh, that is areas that have been forest areas that have been recently degraded and that show promise um, to for restoration. Um, looks at them by the amount of carbon they are able to sequester in panel A. In panel B, it looks at the population living directly within um, a one kilometer by one kilometer, approximately a 30 arc second, but one kilometer by one kilometer pixel of forest restoration opportunity. So how many people are living directly inside that forest restoration opportunity area? In addition to the income level, as uh, described by the World Bank, for the different forest restoration opportunity areas. And what we see is some of the areas with the greatest amount of population um, and some of the areas with the greatest opportunity to sequester carbon exist in lower middle or lower income countries. So there's huge potential for forest restoration projects to contribute to the well-being of forest proximate people. However, um, as Stan Turf and colleagues uh, very, very accurately portray, uh, over time, the prominence and the enthusiasm for any type of environmental fad, in this case, forest restoration, tends to decline. So the issue will be to make sure that forest restoration commitments and general greenhouse gas commitments, such as the NDCs, tend to focus on providing human well-being benefits through forests at the same time they focus on carbon sequestration and climate mitigation. This is hugely important. We need to start thinking uh, very carefully about how best to manage co-benefits. Otherwise, that multi-dimensional set of well-being indicators is not going to be realized. So, I'm coming to my conclusions now, which I think will allow us to have a long discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. Today, I spoke about the many pathways through which forests contribute to human well being. We have flows from ecosystem service function to well being benefits, as well as flows from forest conservation and restoration projects to well being benefits. The first, when we go directly from ecosystem service function to well being, are those types of provisioning, supporting services that directly influence human well-being. You can think of that as uh, the goods that forests provide, the supporting and regulating services on climate that they provide people both today and in the future. However, I'm arguing that we need to expand our consideration about how forests contribute to human well-being to take into consideration the way in which human beings organize themselves in order to supplement or improve forests, conserve forests, and how that both directly contributes to human well being and indirectly contributes to human well being by improving forest ecosystems, which then in turn uh, improves human well being through provisioning and supporting and regulating and cultural services. However, as we know, there are many barriers that block forest to well being pathways. Though many of us are aware of the benefits that forests provide to human populations, um, 
there is an incentive to convert forests to other uses, specifically uses for agricultural commodities. And it's important to weigh the pros and cons, especially over long time horizons of such conversion. Policy and governance allows us to work towards objectives that equitably share the benefits from forest lands with a greater number of people. Uh, and it seeks to address those barriers. And the contemporary issues that I've discussed that are most pertinent towards to forest governance that seeks to strengthen the pathways between forests and human well-being include decentralization reforms, which aim to provide more local administrative units or people, um, greater management and use rights for forests under the assumption that those who depend on forests most directly have the greatest interest in conserving them and benefiting from them in the long run. I discussed non-state market-driven governance and sustainable certification as a way outside of government by which corporations seek to work with consumers to channel sustainable forest management equitably share well-being benefits or more equitably share well-being benefits over the long term. And then finally, I discussed briefly international commitments to forest governance and management. And these international commitments seek to, from the top down, from the national level down, to incent different administrations within domestic governments to work towards reductions in greenhouse gases and to work towards forest restoration to provide benefits to local populations and citizens over the long term. And that's my presentation today. Thank you very much for your time. If there's anything uh, that was of interest in my presentation to you, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, specifically, if there is an article or something that you don't have access to, I can help with that. Uh, and with that, I look very much forward to questions and discussion. Okay, thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, we have already uh, several questions in our uh, chat uh, rooms. I would like to read the third first question. The first question coming from Rita Bangun. How the relationship between oil palm plantation and the forest future about human well-being in Indonesia? Second question. During the COVID-19 pandemic, communities around the forest area would exploit more forest products. Do you have the right formula in determining the balance between economic use and forest conservation? What kind of policy program do you think is right for addressing the problem of forest in Indonesia? And the uh, uh, third question, considering Indonesia is a developing country and heavily relies on the development of its infrastructure, like uh, highways, railways, power plants, etc. How do you suggest we continue to implement forest restoration to serve as a reminder about the importance of forest on human well-being? Or, uh, yeah, we just uh, make a physical development. This is the third question first, James, please. Sure. Um, so those are the first three questions. I'll answer them in order to the best of my ability. So the first question that uh, regards oil palm conversion, specifically in Indonesia, and the benefits from forests to human well-being. I think it's important to understand the drivers of forest conversion that occur um, at the behest of oil palm planting. Uh, it's important to recognize that right now there is um, a policy failure, that oil palm is much more valuable to local communities. There's more established um, supply chain networks for oil palm as a commodity that is produced and sold at a global level, then there is, let's say, a carbon market. Um, or then there is for um, extensive tourism. Those supply chains are often disrupted. And so it's difficult to pinpoint exactly how to best resolve this conflict that or what a lot of people perceive as a conflict uh, that oil palm is leading to the conversion of a lot of um, tropical forest area in Indonesia. Now, I think the national government has taken a lot of right steps saying there are certain forest lands that we are unwilling, that we are putting a moratorium on for future conversion. 
Like that's a very valid first step. Um, and then we have to think, start thinking creatively about how to ensure that those lands that have already been converted contribute the most to proximate communities so that further expansion is um, not as valuable as it would be otherwise. Um, and then I think the final step is to start thinking creatively about how natural climate solutions like forest co conservation and forest restoration can contribute more directly to forest proximate people um, and can kind of combat this large scale plantation conversion that we're seeing, um, not only in Indonesia, but around the world. Uh, it's certain to happen much more so in West Africa than it ever has before. And these are important things if we're convinced that forests contribute uh, to human well-being over long time horizons in ways that a lot of commodity agriculture cannot. These are some important policy and governance um, questions that we're going to have to start addressing more directly. And I think that some of the most plausible situations are those which provide incentives um, to consumers as well as to forest proximate people and governments. So that was the first question. I hope I addressed it, even if I wasn't able to answer it directly. Um, the second question about how forest proximate communities, um, I guess the second question, it was both a statement and a question. So the statement seemed to be that forest proximate communities are more likely to um, unsustainably use forest resources during the time of COVID-19, and how do we address that? So I think that's an interesting thought. Uh, it's yet to be shown substantively. It's a presumption that forest proximate communities are more likely to harvest forests illegally or extra legally in a time of a global pandemic. It's, pl it's possible. It's plausible. Um, I think that the way in which governments approach that issue is critical. I think that coupled with the third question about infrastructure development. Um, I am a very big proponent of, uh, of localizing decentralized forest management. There are a lot of risks involved with decentralizing forest management, but there are a lot of benefits to be gained for indigenous people and local communities specifically who are interested in managing and using the forest land. Um, the way this relates to both question two and three is that communities that have an interest in managing forests who have a stake in the way in which forests are managed and used are more likely in a time of crisis to reconsider um, illegal or extra legal forest cover harvesting. Um, and the reason that is, is because those communities have the rights to manage and use forests over the long term. Now, that is also um, what a lot of people who study forest governance find as a mediating factor between um, infrastructure development and forest cover loss. So the standard narrative is that a new, a new road is built and that from this road we see uh, forest fragmentation occurring. <clears throat> And yeah, that, that, that happens quite frequently. However, if those people who live most closely and depend most directly on forests are charged with management and access, they have more of an incentive to prohibit this extra legal forest cover loss. Um, and so while decentralizing forest management is by no means a panacea um, and needs to be done in a very in a very conscientious and in a very um, careful manner, I do think it holds a lot of promise for communities in the long term using forests to the best of their ability. The flip side of that, the other on the other hand, um, if you provide communities with forest management rights, you also run the risk that they may choose at any given time um, to liquidate their forest assets, to cut down the forest if they are giving full property rights. Um, and then it becomes a question of, I think, environmental justice. Is that the way in which we want our forests managed? Is it possible to manage forests on a large scale like that? Because as I said, most of the forests around the world are still owned and managed by central government. Um, 
And this is leading to a lot of the governance or the policy shortfalls and gaps that we're seeing where we have illegal or extra legal forest use. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, the next uh, three question. First from uh, Bart van Assen, our, our colleague from uh, Netherlands, but uh, you're already uh, live in Indonesia for <laughs> more than uh, 20 years, I think. Are scientific papers available on the measurable impacts on public or private certification standards such as SPLK or FSG? And the second question coming from Giselle Darip Kalumban Gaul. Indonesia, there are regulations to prohibit land, land clearing through forest burning system, but there are still many people doing it. What kind of regulation uh, is more effective for human beings? Or oh, and uh, uh, for uh, forest sustainability, and then uh, the third question uh, from Muhammad Farus Dak. He wants to ask about the bond challenge to begin forest restoration that focus on climate regulation and human well-being as well as uh, at the same time. Uh, so many questions is what kind of areas that will be the place of the project does it mean that it will be it will be flattened settlement or yes uh, this is the three equations James please great so the first question about evidence of the impact of eco certification on human well-being is a very good one um, some of the papers that I've been most compelled by are by Kimberly Carlson who uh, is now I believe at NYU um, and she studies the impact of RSPO or sustainable palm oil certification on human well-being specifically on economic indicators um, and on <clears throat> interestingly enough related to the quest the next question on fires as well um, the evidence is pretty compelling though uh, it seems that the story is not yet entirely told because there are lots of case studies where we find that eco-certification in terms of providing human well-being benefits on the ground doesn't do a lot. Um, that it really just provides market access to those who are able to afford the certification and it prohibits market access for those who are unable to afford it. Some of my earliest research with Pat Dodik was looking at the, um, it was early days then, this is in 2011, it was looking at the way in which SVLK was going to be implemented in Indonesia, in central Java specifically, and how much smallholders knew about um, legal forest certification a year or two before it was supposed to be rolled out nationally, nationally mandatory. And um, the short answer is many smallholders had no idea that this uh, regulation was coming, which is troubling um, because the question then becomes, who's benefiting from eco certifications. Uh, I do think more and more evidence is mounting that as certification standards become entrenched in the way corporations do business, that we're seeing more equitable sharing among, uh, and I, it's comparative, right? There are benefits that are accruing to the way in which uh, agricultural commodities are being produced when we have eco certification. So, uh, for example, in Indonesia, the plasma sharing scheme, right, which I guess I read is recently being reviewed for potential repeal. Um, but nonetheless, the idea that uh, oil palm companies are mandated to uh, provide benefits to local communities is a step in the right direction. More eco certifications that ensure that, the better. Right now, um, it's more on production standards and less on social arrangements which hopefully we're seeing some amount of advocacy to change that. So the strong evidence for providing human well-being benefits to proximate communities is, I would argue, rather lacking. Um, however, there are some examples of when it does occur. The second question about setting fires, about fire management in Indonesia, and how best to provide a policy mechanism or governance mechanisms to um, reduce the amount of slash and burn or fires that are being set. There 
was recently um, a randomized control trial of payments to communities to ensure that nobody, that there was no fire lit within a given DESA boundary. This was research performed by Smeru uh, in Patsudarno at Smeru and um, a faculty member at ANU named Ryan Edwards. And what they found was that payments directly to communities, if they are of the right amount, and I can't remember the amount off the top of my head, were an extremely effective way uh, for the management of fires. So this is getting back to something you've heard me talk about a lot by now, um, that when you provide direct incentives to communities to govern themselves, and those incentives are real, whether or not they're payments or if they're payments in kind, so the provision of some sort of like material benefit that's not necessarily cash, um, it seems like wildfire prevention um, actually works pretty well, at least it did in that study. And that's forthcoming, I believe, in uh, world development. And that's one option. But I think the issue is how do you roll out something like that? Like the one of the issues you may have uh, discussed about payments for ecosystem services is how best to scale it up. We have a lot of the good examples of payments for ecosystem services that are kind of case-based. So um, there's a given community or collection of communities that receive payments for uh, providing and supplementing ecosystem services. And it seems to be rather successful, but how does that work at a national level um, to really, in this case, combat wildfire? I think that's a really good question. Um, and it seems like direct incentives potentially through um, the village fund that would potentially be a possibility. Um, in addition to perhaps increasing monitoring and evaluation of uh, both of, of forest lands, I, I guess uh, approaching it from kind of both the top and the bottom is often the most successful. And the final question, um, was that about infrastructure development, Pat Dodik? That's about the bond challenge. One, oh, about one challenge. One Sorry. challenge to begin forest restoration that mm -hmm. focus on climate regulation and human mm -hmm. well-being. Mm -hmm. So the Bond Challenge um, seeks to begin restoration on 350 million hectares by 2030. So I presented some maps that show forest restoration opportunity areas, and I believe the question was focused on that. Um, so these forest restoration opportunity areas, uh, there's a lot of contention surrounding where forests should be restored. Uh, there was some work done in 2011 by a man named Peter Potapov and his team that uh, for the World Resources Institute um, sought to identify forest restoration opportunities. There is some criticism of the map that that team produced the way they produced it was by looking at where population densities were lower um, than about 100 people per kilometer, where um, precipitation levels, temperatures were such that forest restoration was possible. And what we call that, they layered all of these different uh, spatial data sets and found uh, one kilometer pixels where they thought forest restoration was possible. Now, the academic debate surrounding those forest restoration opportunities was that it identified about 9 million hectares of native grasslands as um, a plausible alternative for forest restoration. So uh, that was a rather acrimonious debate. People got very upset. And what we see happening again with more recent research, and this is just last year, uh, there was a modeling exercise, I uh, believe by, um, man with the last name Bastin that looked at how at the at the tree carrying capacity of earth. So how many trees could earth actually support if we wanted to use that method as a night, as a natural climate solution. And um, it was much higher than anybody had anticipated. Uh, the methods were very strong, but the insight here is that we have to start combining these forest restoration opportunities 
um, with co-benefits and with thinking very, very specifically about policy outcomes, because it's, it's well and good to create a map and say, this is where forests could potentially be restored, but it's a much different situation to actually channel that into the implementation of forest restoration. And so what some of my work is doing right now is trying to say, if we consider forest restoration opportunities in line with where people, local people might receive the most co-benefits from restoration projects and from rest restored forests, how does that change the map? Um, and so kind of informing these forest restoration opportunities, which have received a, a lot of criticism with uh, socio-political information. So um, one, where are people living? Two, where might people receive the most benefits from infrastructure development or um, direct benefits from restoration projects? And three, where are people able to hold uh, forest management rights at a local level? Those three levels of information, combining that with opportunities for forest restoration, I think is a very, it's, it's a more informed way of proceeding. Thank you, James. I think uh, talking about the uh, climate regulation, we have to thanks to COVID-19 because with COVID-19, uh, it is equal to 10 or 20 uh, years, yeah, uh, emission reduction in the world because uh, COVID-19 has uh, shut down many industries and also uh, traffic all over the world without any yeah. uh, conventions, <laughs> yeah, without so any uh, political com convention, yeah, without any commitments. But uh, yeah. COVID-19 commit to reduce the... <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think mean, that's also... Okay. It's interesting. <laughs> like, uh, COVID-19, it disrupts supply chains massively, right? Uh, what it yeah. doesn't... You know, it, it's interesting to think about COVID-19 and global pandemics in relation to how environmental policy and governance uh, is resilient. Like, what is what are the types of governance and management uh, solutions that are resilient to COVID-19? What we're seeing is a strong national government response um, <laughs> stronger other places, weaker other places. Um, and it seems like that is a testament to the resilience of kind of the nation state in this more top-down or hierarchical policy structure. Um, local governments are also responding in their own way. And I think it, it's kind of a testament to how policy is able to um, weather the storm of recession Whereas eco-certification, um, unless it is taken up as kind of an industry standard, is much less effective when people aren't buying something or don't have the, the extra cash to pay a little bit more for something that is eco-certified, because often it costs a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, in the world of COVID-19, things are where I, I find myself questioning the different ways environmental policy unfolds. Okay, next question, James, uh, from Annie in uh, Torku, Finland. How the property rights issues will affect uh, the forest governance, since not all forest areas in the world are uh, a state-owned forest? And uh, the other question uh, from Germany, I think. How do formal uh, forest policies, processes, and institutions facilitate or constrain on policy and human well-being? with extra sectoral influence. And then uh, I think it is uh, from Malaysia, uh, just uh, uh, acknowledgement. And then from uh, Corey Febrile Ilham, decentralization does not guarantee that uh, local people gain more profit and a more commitment committed to protect uh, natural resources. When and where is, uh, when and where uh, is the decentralized natural resources management policy suitable for implementation? Please, James. Hmm. Uh, so the first question, which considers property rights in forest management. Um, and I guess to some extent, the third question, they're kind of related. Where are the limitations of decentralization and where does it perhaps not work as effectively? If I'm understanding those, those questions correctly. Um, yeah, so we think of um, management property rights as a bundle of rights that people hold. Um, and the strictest of the bundle of rights is the ability to sell off land, right? So 
that's the idea that if you have something that you own privately, you can sell it to somebody else. Um, when it comes to land management property rights, we often refer to that as uh, the ability to transfer. Um, some people call like the strictest property right, the right to alienation. What we find is that, yeah, the majority of governments own, uh, or sorry, the majority of forest land remains owned by governments, but there is a strong, there's a large number of people who own, own land. Um, and so I think when he was speaking to those people, like what do we do about privately owned forests? Um, there's some really interesting research coming out of the United States, which combines um, real estate databases and forest cover to understand how private property owners are managing their personal forests. Um, some of the work that I've done previously looking at smallholders and timber production uh, takes a similar approach to try to understand when somebody owns forests or trees independently, individually, how does that change kind of their decision matrix with regards to forest management? What the research that's focused on this area of the United States, the Northeastern area found, and this is research led by Christoph Nolte at uh, Boston University, they found that actually smallholders, those people who own private forests, are more willing over the long term in this area to conserve forest cover than nationally owned forest areas. And this is kind of an interesting result. We often don't think that's the case. Uh, the reason they posit this is happening, specifically, I think this study was in Massachusetts, is because people aren't in that area holding forests for um, economic benefit. They are owning land because uh, they enjoy it. There's an aesthetic value to having forest property. And so uh, kind of comes as um, there's a lack of forest dependence, I would say, which defines that relationship where you have smallholders that aren't converting forest lands to other uses that are retaining it as forest in this particular area. Um, I'm not exactly sure the extent to which smallholders or private or forests are private land. I think that's an interesting question, but it pales in comparison to the extent to which national governments do own forests. Um, so ensuring that people, that forest conservation, forest restoration goes hand in hand with, um, with private forest ownership. I think, you know, the incentive structure has to align or people have to value um, forests as standing for aesthetic, spiritual, religious reasons um, and not depend on them directly. Uh, is, is one option that we've, we've seen in the United States. Um, and so when it comes to the limitations of decentralization reforms, which I believe was the third question, yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Um, local management doesn't work everywhere. There are a lot of examples of how local management can generate um, outcomes that are not equitable, where political elites are able to capture the benefit of natural resources, be they forests or fisheries or, uh, or pastures. Um, and I think, so that's why I always put in the caveat that the way in which a decentralization reform is implemented is, as, is more critical than actually implementing the decentralization reform. And what I mean by that is, if significant capacity is not already in place or isn't effectively transferred to more local administrative units, then it runs the risk of um, actually resulting in uh, less cohesive and strong governance. So there's this concept that I've written a little bit about called responsabilization. Uh, the idea is that uh, when a decentralization reform happens, a central actor or government is responsabilizing. It's making a lower or local administrative unit or community responsible for, and, and it might be natural resource management. There are a significant number of studies that look at how uh, schools make students responsible for their own learning. Indeed, in time of COVID-19, we're seeing that happen at a much more uh, greater level than we've ever seen it before. 
But the idea is um, responsabilization kind of keys in and says, is this, uh, is this an ethical transfer of responsibility? So in the case of decentralized forest management, you'd have to make sure that those who are receiving the responsibilities for forest management are willing and able to manage and use forests. Um, when they are unwilling or unable, that is uh, an area in which either capacity has to be developed or for local forest management shouldn't occur. Uh, and I think we've seen, there, there are several examples in literature about how decentralization policies, when they are not hand in hand with effective transfer of rights, actually serve as what are called recentralization strategies. So by kind of pushing those responsibilities to local, more local units, um, sometimes central governments are actually able to step in later and say, you didn't manage your forests appropriately. We're going to reappropriate some of uh, those forest areas because you couldn't handle it. Uh, and the question is, why did that occur? There's a paper by Jesse Ribot and Arun Agrawal uh, from 2006 that focuses specifically on um, decentralization as a strategy for recentralization. I think that really points to a lot of failures of decentralization policy. And uh, Pat Dodi, the second question, could you read that one again? Yeah, I think the se second uh, question is about uh, how do formal forest policies, processes, and institutions facilitate or constrain on policy and human well-being? Mm. That's a good question. So I've been talking about a lot. The basic structure of the presentation was that conserving and restoring forests is a collective action problem. Collective action problem is one that it's hard to get a group of people to work in their own best interest over the long term because we have a lot of short term uh, payoffs that seem better in the moment, but in the long term might not be as beneficial to the group. Um, but the question, in, and then I was arguing that policy and governance seeks to address that issue and to consider longer time horizons that provide greater payoffs to a greater number of people. The question here is when, does, when do those types of policy and governance issues either backfire or from the very beginning curb the ability from forests to contribute to um, local well-being? Um, and I think that any policy or governance solution has the potential to backfire. Uh, there's an interesting economic effect called the Peltzman effect that looks at how when regulation is put in place, it's possible for it to actually generate the opposite in terms of the objective it was seeking to reach. So in this case, if you had a forest regulation in place uh, that sought to conserve forests, there's a chance by virtue of the regulation itself that it would actually result in greater deforestation. There's a really example of this interesting example of this effect in the United States, uh, but it focuses not on forest management directly, but indirectly it does. It focuses on the Endangered Species Act. So here in the United States, um, the Endangered Species Act, if an endangered species is found on your property um, by a government organization, that means that your ability to develop that property is arrested. You're no longer able to change it because it is home to an endangered species. So the red cockaded woodpecker, which is a type of woodpecker found in the southeastern United States, was listed as an endangered species. The moment it was listed, there was a spike in deforestation that was occurring on private properties that were more likely to have habitat for the red cockaded woodpecker. The reason being, those people who owned the property that had forests that was good habitat for the red cockaded woodpecker, wanted the opportunity to develop their land into the future. And so in order to protect that right, they cut down the forest. And if you think about it, the Endangered Species Act was trying to preserve the forest for the red cockaded woodpecker, but ended up working in opposition to its own objectives. So 
what do you do in a situation okay. like that? It's like, it's an unforeseen consequence. And it is an example of how regulation that's supposed to help actually hurt this environmental benefit. Um, yeah, I think there, those types of examples abound. And I think that one solution or one kind of pat answer is adaptive regulation or adaptive management. So if you see that this type of regulation is actually incentivizing people to cut down forests that would be beneficial to an endangered species, you have to adapt that regulation to actually achieve the object that you're going for. Okay, the uh, last three questions, uh, Jim. In, uh, this is from Sahara Ramadan. In January 2019, there was a big uh, fire in Amazon forest uh, and caused a uh, huge of losses. And uh, yeah. we know there in USA, there is no uh, shifting cultivation anymore. So <laughs> the question is, what is the most effective way to prevent forest fire? And uh, the, yeah, the question from Sunny Ritz, uh, Germany. How much fresh land does this earth need to maintain the sustainable socioeconomic development? Because in Indonesia, the minimum forest land, forest cover is 30 percent, and it is a still a big debate in Indonesia. And now uh, the stand is uh, 60, about 67 percent, but uh, it will be, or must be, yeah, must be uh, 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 reduced, yeah. But uh, we didn't have uh, any uh, agreement, yeah, uh, until. Uh, how many percent yeah, the forest cover uh, should be maintained? And the last question from uh, Fitri Norfatriani, our colleague, uh, how to distinguish the pathway of non-state market, non-state market driven as market competition or truly to uh, support forest for well-being? And that is uh, my uh, uh, personal last question, yeah, because uh, I know that you uh, you have uh, many experiences in Indonesia. Theoretically, there are uh, three causes of uh, the policy failure. Uh, bad policy, bad exclusion, and the third one is bad luck. But we didn't uh, discuss about the bad luck. <laughs> yeah. The first one is uh, bad policy. It means that uh, uh, the substance of the policy is itself is bad. So if we implement the policy consistently, then the result is consistently bad. Mm. <laughs> and the second one, uh, that exclusion, the substance of policy might be as, uh, quite good, but uh, it is implemented uh, badly. How about your opinion? How do you find an Indonesian situation? The situation is bad policy or bad luck or both? Mm. Please, okay. uh, your uh, short question, short answer, James. <laughs> <laughs> short answer. Um, yeah, because, okay. uh, yeah, I'll start with your question first, Odig, and then work backwards. Um, I think that the Indonesian situation when it comes to forest conversion is kind of a, I wouldn't say bad luck, um, but I do think that at some level, um, it's using a previous system, uh, I don't want to say outdated, but it's really hard for any Ministry of Forestry or Ministry of Forestry Environment, no matter where you are, to stay abreast of all of the globalized challenges today, right? So I think that were it to be perfectly implemented, were we to have enough funding, labor, et cetera, you would see no problems in terms of forest management, right? But that's an ideal world that does not exist. Um, and so facing the realities of forest policy, I think it's a little bit of bad luck. Um, and I think there's a little lack of clarity when it comes to different levels of administration and forest responsibilities, though that's quickly changing in Indonesia. We're seeing a lot of more, a lot more legislative and political reforms that are clarifying forest policy. Um, so I think the future is very bright. And I, I mean, and that's borne out by a lot of research on forest cover loss that removes um, forest fires, especially if it removes forest fires, um, which I think, you know, are a phenomenon that kind of happens cyclically, even though they are human driven. I think that's the best way to think about it. Um, and then the other questions. So can you refresh my memory? What were the other questions, Pat Dodi? Yeah, uh, how much forest land does this earth exist? Uh, yeah, that's really, yeah. 
So that's an interesting question. How much canopy cover designates forest land? And this is something yeah. that my colleagues who are ecologists, forest ecologists, I, it, can, it can lead to very long conversations about, you know, some people think that canopy cover is not a very good measurement of what is a forest. Because if you look at different ecosystems around the world, we have forests that are, you know, very sparsely canopy covered. Um, some think it's you know, the only way and it's the future given remote sensing technology. Some think that LIDAR is going to be the saving grace. We're actually able to look at structural complexity on the different layers of the forest. I don't think there's any simple answer. Everybody seems to, or not everybody, uh, most people who are using publicly available data sets just kind of throw up their hands and say 30% seems fine to me. Um, is that the best way to approach it? I don't think so. But I do think that um, having a shared standard is valuable. Uh, now, obviously, if you change the threshold from 30 to 50 to 75 to 100, you're changing uh, the way in which forests are defined across a landscape. You're including or excluding different parcels. And I think that kind of a, a, a national map um, would be very sensitive to this. And I think that as we see those changes being made in Indonesia and elsewhere, I think the most important thing is to think about what's driving the incentive to change the definition of forest. And is that something that is beneficial uh, to you know, a given community or into, to a given individual's political or ethical interests? I think that the mere definition and changing of the definition is almost more interesting to me than the definition of a forest itself, but that's because I'm a social scientist. So. Okay. And the uh, last, how to distinguish the pathway of non-state market driven as market competition or truly to support rest for well-being? This is the, the last question from uh, Bu Fitri. Okay. Perhaps a very short answer. Okay. So how do we support non-state market driven governance uh, in contributing to human well-being as opposed to just being um, something that increases market share? Is that is that the question, Pandori? Yeah, that's how to distinguish the pathway of non-state um, market driven as market competition. This is market competition or truly to support forest for well-being. I, I mean, uh, it is like yeah. the hidden agenda, hidden agenda of uh, the non-state uh, market driven. Yeah, yeah I think um, we, I was touching on this a little bit before. I think perhaps uh, from my perspective, again, from the social scientist perspective, uh, I think the most beneficial way to secure that pathway between NSMD, not state market driven governance and human well-being is to ensure a greater number of social safeguards. The trade-off is that, you know, the more safeguards and the more criteria that any eco certification has to maintain, the more expensive it is and the fewer people who can afford it. But I would say that um, ensuring that um, there is some equitable transfer of rights or benefits um, to forest proximate people or uh, commodity proximate people is hugely important, something we don't really focus on enough or see enough in eco-certification. Okay, James, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, discussions. And uh, actually, I uh, am very interested in... Uh, your application, life well application. Anyway, wh yeah. when uh, this application will be available in uh, Google App Store? <laughs> <laughs> it's not available in the App Store. <laughs> I think many people <laughs> are just waiting uh, for the application. <laughs> okay, good to know. Maybe maybe that's the platform we should do it on. Right now, it lives on the website, but we could change that. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much, Pat Dodi and IPB for inviting me to the screen talk. I've enjoyed it. Your <laughs> questions were fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, James. Pari, please, your time is yours. Right, Pak Dodi. Thank you so much for moderating this excellent discussion. And Pak James, that is your super comprehensive presentation and great responses uh, to the question raised by the participant. Thank you so much. I'm sure thank we will have a lot of new uh, knowledge and also uh, got some uh, experience from you. Now, uh, we will listen to a closing remark from head of department of ESL ITB University, Dr. Ahyar Ismail. 
Pak Ahyar, please, Pak. Halo, Pak Ahyar. Is Pak Ahyar here? Pak Ahyar masih mute. Oke. Oke, oke. Oke. Okay. Ah, please, Pak. Thank okay, you. Oke, okay, oke, okay. Sorry, sorry. Oke, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And thank you, uh, Dr. James uh, Tom, uh, James Thomas uh, R. R. Bach. I'm sorry if uh, if uh, I mistake. Um, let's uh, give uh, applause. Uh, My Excellency, uh, our Dean, uh, Professor Dr. Donung Nuryartono. Uh, My Excellency, uh, special our speaker, Dr. James uh, Thomas. Our moderator, Professor Dr. Uh, Dodi Ridon Rahmat, Pak Hari uh, Priyadi, and uh, Dr. Mati Ekayani uh, as the Secretary of the ESL Department, and uh, my respectable to all uh, audiences. Uh, First of all, I um, uh, my name is Ahyar Ismail. As the head of the ESL department, I would like to thank Professor Nunung Nuryartono as the, uh, the dean of uh, of the Faculty uh, of uh, Economic and Management IPB University, and uh, also as the uh, opening uh, speakers for this activity. Thanks. Uh, as well as uh, two speaker from the what is department of uh, environmental studies at uh, Dartmouth College USA Dr. James uh, Thomas uh, Erbach and uh, to the moderator professor Dr. Dodi uh, Ridanur Rahmat uh, he is also uh, as a vice uh, rector Pak Hari Priyadi as the host of uh, this Event and Dr. Mati Ekayani uh, as the uh, person in charge uh, of the course uh, and the entire committee for the implementation uh, of the uh, this lecture and uh, all participants who join in this activity from domestic and international uh, participants from in this. Uh, 11 countries at 11 or 12 countries Netherlands, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Germany, Mexico, UK, Tunisia. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the top activity of the plant uh, Green Talk uh, platform in in the ESL department. Uh, of course, we are very happy for the uh, implementation of uh, this activity uh, and hope uh, that IPB University could uh, seek uh, potential collaboration uh, with uh, the What's your college? Uh, Dart Dartman College, and of course, uh, from this uh, activity, uh, we hope uh, next time maybe uh, we uh, will uh, collaborate about research uh, and maybe uh, student exchange with your college. Uh, finally, I'm uh, sure that participants could gain knowledge uh, from speaker above who have uh, shared with uh, the what's title global issues in the forest and environmental especially in in the perspective uh, on policy and human well-being and uh, thank you so much uh, to all committees, uh, Pak Danang and team, who have uh, worked hard to 
prefer this activity. Thank you very much. And the last, uh, I would like to say thank to all participants who joined uh, at this activity. And I'm very, very sorry. Sorry, uh, I do, uh, uh, if uh, there are. I think something happened with the uh, network in Pa Ahyar locations. Yeah. Pa Ahyar? Otherwise? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pa Ahyar. Okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will let Ibu Meti to talk about the, uh, what you call, remark or something else, because uh, Dr. Mete Kayani is the course coordinator for the forest economic in uh, ESL department. Please, Ibu Mete. Okay, uh, thank you, Pahari. Uh, James, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. James, for your sharing, especially for my student, since this webinar is part of uh, forest economic lecture. Uh, policy and human being are important beside the economic side. Uh, and I'm sure it will enrich of my students' knowledge. Thank you so much, Dr. James. And also thanks to uh, Prof. Nuno, Prof. Dodi, Pak Ahyar, Pak Hari, and Pak Danang and team, and all of the participants uh, that we can make this webinar successful. Thank you, Pak Hari. Thank you, Ibu Meti. Uh, so we come to the end of the uh, third ESL Green Talk. Thank you so much for all, all, all of you. I mean, for all participation with, uh, you guys are very active in questioning the, the uh, speaker. So see you again for the upcoming Green Talk event. Pak Jem, thank you. Uh, Ibu Meti and Tim Pak Ahyar and all of you, thank you so much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good night. Bye bye. Night bye. Waalaikum salam. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Bye bye. Bye.